So the next thing I want to talk about is actually end behavior models. Um, this is needed for us to be able to talk about what happens with limits where the X is going to positive or negative infinity. And I said that those tend to be more challenging because of the fact we, fact we can't really use graphs or tables to help us out because the numbers are so far out there that it, it just doesn't, that we can't even conceive of it. So to help us with that, we use what are called end behavior models. These can only be used as X is going to positive or negative infinity. And the idea behind this is that as the magnitude of an X value increases, in a function, certain terms will begin to dominate the other terms. And once we get to suffic sufficiently large values of X, which I know is a weird phrase, but X gets big enough eventually that one term dominates the others by being so much larger in size that the others don't really make a huge difference. Um, the analogy you're going to hear me use throughout the year is uh, elephants and ants. Uh, at the Cincinnati Zoo, if, when they want to weigh an elephant, they actually have a room where the entire room of the, the entire floor of the room is a scale. And they just have the elephant walk into the room so they can weigh it. But what happens if an ant happens to crawl onto the floor of that room, onto the scale, at the same time as the elephant? Is there going to be a real significant difference in the weight that's shown? Well, no, because the elephant's weight is so much larger than the weight of an ant that the fact that an ant is on the scale at the same time really doesn't matter, so you can ignore the ant. That's what we do when we use end behavior models. We are trying to figure out within a function, as X's size gets larger, as X goes to positive or negative infinity, which term becomes the elephant, and what terms can we ignore in that situation because they're the ants. When you get comfortable with this, the biggest mistake is that we try to, people try to use these for everything. They can really only be used for limits as X is going to positive or negative infinity. So kind of an example here is this polynomial that we're looking at with X to the seventh plus six X to the third minus two X squared plus five. When I'm being asked to figure out an end behavior model, I kind of in my head do part of a table uh, and I typically use powers of 10 because the math for powers of 10 is usually easier. So I, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, if I say g to the 10th, well, that's 10 to the 7th plus 6 times 10 to the 3rd minus 2 times 10 squared plus 5. Well, 10 to the 7th is 10 million, which is a lot bigger than 5. If you think about it in terms of money, if you had $10 million and you misplaced a $5 bill, you probably wouldn't be too worried about the $5 bill. So at this point, we're going to say, you know what, we can ignore the five because the 10th of the seventh is so much larger. So then I say, okay, well, let's go ahead and go to the next power of 10. So G of 10 squared or G of 100. That's 10 to the 14th plus six times 10 to the sixth minus two times 10 to the fourth. And we're ignoring the five because we already said it's small, that small enough for us to ignore. 10 to the 14th is uh, 100 quadrillion. <laughs> when you put it that way, I mean, it's, I put it that way, it sounds really large. So even though 10 to the fourth is 10,000, compared to 10 quadrillion, 10,000 really doesn't matter. It, it's not having a big effect. So we're going to ignore this term. So I can then move on to say, well, all right, um, what about if I plug in 10 to the third? That's 10 to the 21st. So that's one followed by 21 zeros. I'm not even going to try to think of the name that's based on the Latin and the Greek. Plus six times 10 to the ninth, which is uh, one billion, well, six billion. But Compared to 10 to the 21st, 6 billion is 
really not large is an ant. And I can see that this difference is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger the further we go. So I can ignore this term. And what I can say is the end behavior model as we go to the right. So as X is going to positive infinity, so what we call the right end behavior model. My function G looks a lot like Y equals X to the seventh. So once X gets big enough, if I if it were possible for me to graph way out to the right, I would not see a difference between the graph of g of x and the graph of y equals x to the seventh, because the x to the seventh size gets so big, the other terms are ants compared to the elephant. So next, to kind of help you with this, because this is something we're going to have to practice over and over and over and over again. This is not a natural way for us to think, because we're being forced to think about numbers that are too big for us to really think about, which is an oxymoron, and I get that. But kind of our growth from fastest to slowest is a nice thing to know. So factorials. Uh, remember factorial is, so like here, if I had four factorial, that's the same as saying four times three times two times one. Factorials grow faster than anything else. They are the fastest growing term we could have, followed by exponentials. But we have to watch out for negative exponents because exponentials only grow fast when the exponent is positive. If the exponent is negative, exponentials are slow. Polynomials are the easiest ones to work with, and you did a version of this when you were in Algebra 2, when you would find horizontal asymptotes of rational functions that had polynomials for the numerator and denominator. Um, with polynomials, it doesn't matter whether we have positive or negatives, the highest degreed term wins. So what we saw in g of x on the example on the last slide, g of x is going to be the fastest, or the x to the seventh is the fastest growing, even if we had gone to the left where x goes to negative infinity, because it's the highest degree term. And then the slowest growing functions are logarithms. Um, if you see a logarithm, it's going to, it's probably going to get dropped out in when x is going to positive or negative infinity, only in that situation. The trig functions are tricky. Uh, the AP exam typically only throws in sine or cosine for limits as x goes to positive or negative infinity because they're saying, do you remember that the range for sine and cosine is always between negative 1 and 1? And I've got an example of this here. So if I want to find the left and right end behavior models, the way I approach it is I just first start by saying, well, I'm going to find the left EBM and the right EBM. I make a note to myself to remind myself, okay, the left, x is going to negative infinity. For the right, x is going to positive infinity. I like to do the right-hand one first because I find positive numbers easier to work with. Well, I see here in my numerator a mix of polynomial and trig, but sine is always between negative 1 and 1, so even if I just plug in 10, negative 5,000 is already going to be a lot bigger than what sine will be, so I can ignore sine. And then what's re left is a polynomial, and the highest degree term wins. So on top, I have negative 5t cubed. And on bottom, similar reasoning, the polynomial is going to grow faster than the cosine, because cosine is always between negative 1 and 1. So the 6t cubed takes over on the bottom. And if I simplify that, I get negative 5, 6. So this means that when I go way out to the right, as x is approaching negative or approaching positive infinity, my function j of t behaves and looks like the function y equals negative 5, 6. And so that's my right end behavior model. If I go to the left with negative infinity, Negative infinity doesn't change the fact sine and cosine are between positive or between negative and, and positive one. Negative infinity doesn't affect how I deal with polynomials. So going to negative infinity, I end up getting the exact same end behavior model. And this is common. It is not unusual to end up with the exact same end behavior model going both directions. However, we have to check because every once in a while, they're going to be different. For example, over here on my k of x. So 
So the left end behavior model, x goes to negative infinity. My right end behavior model, x goes to positive infinity. I like starting with positive infinity. You don't have to. This is just because I like working with positive numbers more than negative numbers. So if I plug in positive infinity, I see, okay, I've got a polynomial and I've got an exponential. Exponentials grow faster, but I have to wait and check. Do I have negative exponents in my exponential? Well, since x is going to positive infinity, x is going to have to be positive numbers, like 10, 100, 1,000. And if I plug them into my exponential, I have like e to the negative 10, e to the negative 100, e to the negative 1,000. And remember, negative exponents flip this, so that's 1 over e to the 10th. 1 over e to the 100th, 1 over e to the 1,000th. So e to the negative x, as x is going to positive infinity, is actually getting smaller while x squared is getting bigger. So even it feels a little weird, but this is why I said for exponentials, make sure you're checking for negative exponents. My right-end right behavior model is going to be the x squared term because the e to the negative x has negative exponents and is getting smaller. So if I now go to my left-end behavior model, again, I've got polynomial, I've got exponential. Exponentials tend to grow faster, but I need to see, are my exponents negative? Well, now, because E is going to negative infinity, X is negative numbers. So if I plug in negative 10, I've got E to the 10th. If I plug in negative 100, I've got E to the 100th. If I plug in negative 1,000, I get E to the 1,000th. So I've got positive exponents for my exponential, which means it's going to grow faster than my polynomial. So going to the left, my, my function behaves and looks like e to the negative x.